thumbs up. This is ECGR 4101, 5101. Welcome! This is lecture number one. All lectures are numbered. It's not by date, so that in the future you don't know what it is. So, my name is Professor James Conrad. I am a computer engineering faculty member here, and this is going to be an exciting class. Woo! 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 Yeah, you <laughs> All right, so... Uh, for those of you who are not used to the U.S., uh, uh, for those of you who are, are not uh, originally from the U.S., are not used to the U.S. form of uh, instruction, this will be a rather interesting class for you uh, in the respect that I'm probably a very unusual teacher. Uh, how many of your faculty members went, woo, in your first day of class, all right? So... Um, my goal here is to teach you everything there is to know about embedded systems. And we're afraid to ask. Well, I'll tell you anyhow. So here's one question. How many of you think you're going to be working in this field when you graduate? Yeah, I think it's, 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 all right. How many of you are going to be working in the power industry and never ever touch anything that's an embedded system? All right. How many of you are going to be working in Oh, communications and never touch anything that has a computer in it. Okay? How many of you are going to be working in mechanical engineering and never touch anything with a computer in it? Not too many of you. So how many of you are going to be working in a field that has embedded systems? That would be everybody, all right? So, if you look around in this room, what do you see that has an embedded system in it? The camera is a good start, right? My cell phone. Your cell phone. The projector. Any of the computer watch. Well, the computers are, are general purpose computers, not necessarily <laughs> embedded systems, but the monitor. The monitor most likely has an embedded system in it. What about, what about this? Oh, the calculator, nice embedded system. It's got a microprocessor in it. What about all this equipment over here sitting on the desk? The skill is That's all got embedded systems. Oh, we already said that. I have something. Oh, there we go. iPod or Music This or Game Boy or uh, what else do we have? Oh, look at this. A motion detector, a camera. All the stuff has embedded systems in it. How many are wearing one right now? Digital watch. So as Dr. Sass uh, alluded to when he talked to you, anything that doesn't have the word computer in it but has a, the computer functionality inside. <coughs> So the idea is this will be one of the more useful courses that you have because most likely everybody, especially in your career, is going to be working on an embedded system. Whether or not you think you are or not, you will. So for example, if you're working in the power industry, all of that sensing equipment that they're now starting to put in, smart grid, it's all about <coughs> embedded computer systems. So they're going to be everywhere. And you know the double E's? They're not taking this stuff. You guys are going to be there for the jobs. Woo! They're going to be looking for you. So, as a little bit of introduction to this, I'm going to show you some embedded systems. Mm, look at this. Mm. It's a nice big board. This was a board that we put in. Here, I'll even uh, put it up on uh, the dock camera. <coughs> This is an unpopulated board. Unpopulated because there's no chips on it. This was a board that we put into a telecommunication switch that would allow us to interface with a PBX and a wireless indoor phone system. So we carried around phones that was kind of like a, a glorified cell phone, or I should say glorified um, um, Cordless phone. Anybody familiar with the uh, technology of DECT? D E C T? Digital equipment, tele a cordless telephone. In other words, in an entire business site, let's say in this whole building, we would put small base stations, and I would have my own mobile phone, and if somebody called my desk phone, or if somebody called my cell phone, all calls would be routed to my phone while I'm inside the building. Thus saving cell phone line charges. So that was what it looked like before it was populated, and this is what it looked like after it was populated. 
And one thing you'll notice, what's, what's one of the things you notice that looks like a mistake? The wire. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's not usual. That's not typical. So this was a prototype board that we did some testing and we discovered some problems. And what it turns out is that uh, on this end, this is where we plugged in uh, our interface to a Siemens PBX. This was a connection to the uh, telephony <coughs> equipment. So just for grins, I'll pass this around. I would appreciate it if you didn't actually pull the wires off of the, uh, off of the board. Oh, I like that. Uh, one thing you'll notice on that is that there's a couple of FPGAs. That stands for what? Field programmable gate arrays. You probably all have had uh, 41, 46, or the equivalent. Hey, look, here's another one where they actually fixed the engineering problems. So uh, I'll start this past over here. So that's an example of an embedded system. It has a computer that's a part of it. And lo and behold, where's the computer? Inside each one of those FPGAs. So what other little goodies do I have? Mm, let's see. Oh, hey, look at this. That was a project I worked on when I was at Ericsson. Here's another one. It's always wires. Look at that. There's another wire. There's two of these. Oh man. QSC bad. Bad. Da, 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 da. So this was uh, an example of a interface board between an IBM PC equivalent ISABUS and a three-dimensional printer driver board. Have you ever seen uh, rapid prototyping? Who has not seen rapid prototyping? All right, here, let's, let's, let's look at this. Lot of views, so let's go look at this. So, in a 3D printing on a computer, you say, Okay, we're going to pull in a file and then we're going to, uh, it's, not, it's not getting to the thing yet. Oh, there it goes. And then uh, it's going to, oh, come on. I see it move something. Oh, this is boring. All right, let's go see another one. Oh, I don't like the way this goes. Uh, three, three printing demo. Let's see this one. And this isn't going to be good. <laughs> this looks like a good start. All right, there we go. So you have something that goes over, and slowly but surely it adds a layer, adds a layer, adds a layer to uh, the device as it goes along. And so um, this board that I'm pointing out right here was a controller for that. So it connected to the PC, and then this side over here connected to analog circuitry, which drove motor drivers. 
So the motor driver actually drove five motors, so it, uh, it raised and lowered a platform, and then a print head could go left, right, <coughs> forward, back, and then uh, another print, or the print head itself could rotate around or tilt. And so this device is an embedded system. Right here is an Intel 80196 microcontroller. This is what's called dual port memory. And this is RAM memory. By the way, this has uh, uh, the capability of storing a small, um, a small program on it using one-time programmable ROM or equivalent to nowadays Flash. So I used a whole bunch of terminology right there. How many of you did not know any of that terminology? RAM, you all know that, right? Yes? Dual port memory. So if I give a quiz today, you all know what dual port memory is, right? All right. Dual port memory is a RAM device where you actually can access all the memory on the chip from two different directions. In other words, from two separate ports. So you can hook it up to two devices, and one device can put memory into it, and the other device can take it out from two different sets of pins that can operate at the exact same time. And the uh, reason it has a couple of wires is that this board was initially defined or designed. It didn't work how we wanted it to, so we actually changed the entire design of how the uh, board worked, and uh, the change in it uh, made it work a lot faster. I'm not going to pass this one around because it's one of a kind. Oh, look at this. This is an old, old memory, uh, memory device. <laughs> and this is really an old memory device. This is, uh, in fact, look at this. There's a stupid little board that has a serial number on it. This is most likely storing eight bits in this vacuum tube. Eight bits. That's a One bite. That's a big yeah. bite, right? <laughs> but back in the old days, in the 50s and 60s, this is how you stored stuff. Vacuum tubes. This I'm not going to toss out. Uh, you probably guess what this is, right? Cell phone? <clears throat> yep, it's a cell phone. Here's another example of an embedded system. Go ahead and toss that one around. <clears throat> And then, uh, let's see if I have anything else in here that looks good. Oh, okay. Remember how I said there's an in-building um, wireless system? This is the base station. Base station means you need to transmit your radio signals so that your cell phone can pick it up. And so here's the device. It has a little bit of stuff on this side, mostly radio. I know that because it's in metal cans. And then... This is a big, huge, giant power uh, um, DC to DC converter. Boy, this thing has been beat up. Uh, this is most likely our microcontroller. It's a special one. And uh, we would uh, send information out to this via RJ45, kind of like Ethernet, right? And then this would uh, send wirelessly. And I'll send this one around too. So. We've seen communications, we've seen manufacturing. I've showed you uh, um, some of the old stuff. There's another one I thought I had, an old bit of core memory, so I'll, I'll just have to pull this up. So again, everywhere. And you will, believe it or not, see as much as you can, or you should try and see as much as you can associated with, uh, with embedded systems and, and have fun with this entire class. So. I'll just throw this over here. When you guys are done, we'll just put them back up. All right, first thing I want to do is go over to syllabus. All of you should have a copy of the syllabus. Did anybody come in late and not get one from up here? Uh, if you have actually gotten a syllabus online, uh, I did make minor changes to it associated with graduate students. I fixed the problem. By the way, if you want to get to my class, the easiest way to do that would be to Google me. 
My page will come up. Here's a link that says classes that Dr. Conrad teaches. And then one of the top ones is 4101, 5101. So if you look on the uh, syllabus, you'll see the website on there, but this is a quick way to get to it. I think most of you have already seen it already. So here's a whole bunch of stuff going on. By the way, uh, there is, as I announced here, an IEEE meeting going on that we're going to visit a printed circuit board manufacturer. So if you are interested, please send me an RSVP. We could only accept the first 25. And so far, I've only got like uh, eight RSVPs. I will be driving there and driving back. So if you do not have a ride, I can accommodate four people. Because I know some of you uh, students that are not US citizens don't have uh, driver's licenses and obviously can't get off of campus to get anywhere. This has all sorts of information. I do want to point out one thing, and that is we have a board, an RX62N. I really want to urge you guys to buy it yourself. I only have a couple that I could loan out. And um, in the past, I required every student to have one, but this semester, I'll allow you to purchase one for every lab pair. So that means the $99 board will only cost you $50 each but then you have to determine who's going to get it. I doubt very seriously you have this board. It is so new, it first came out in October. This is the new board that I'm using associated with the book I've written, and it's actually a neat board. It's a 32-bit board. Uh, here is a, oh, this went straight to DigiQ. Digi so here is, if we look up the RX62N, I want to point out that there is one eval and demo board here that says $823. Do not buy that one. Do not buy that one. You want to buy this one. DigiKey actually is uh, apparently wanting to make a, a, at least some sort of profit on this. And so, uh, ooh, look at this, there's only 12 available now. They sell it for $116 or $111. However, if you go to, I'm just going to Google this. If you go to Renaissance, well, here you go. Here's what the board looks like. It has a whole bunch of stuff. And they say, and this is where it's like, that's not right. DigiKey, it says it has uh, $99. Nah, it's, it's more like uh, 111 However, Future Electronics and Avnet actually do have enough in stock, and it's selling for $99. So if you go to the place, yes, it is, it is for sale. Um, I do recommend, and again, if, uh, I'll put this link on, on the web page. If you're thinking about senior design, what better way, and by the way, if you're thinking about using an embedded board for senior design, what better way than to use the same board you're using in class so that you only have to learn one microcontroller, you're used to one set of software, you're really familiar with it, so you, your learning curve is this semester as opposed to this and next semester when you're trying to learn everything. How many of you are in senior do design one this semester? Raise your hand high. Raise your hand high. All right. How many of you are going to be working on projects that require a microcontroller, most likely? Okay. Most of you should be like that, because you know why? You're going to look for computer engineers for those projects. So, strongly think about using the same board so you don't have to learn new things. Here's the other trick, is uh, if you actually decide to use this board, and you can convince uh, uh, the senior design, your senior design advisor to actually buy it early, then they could buy your board for the class. Ooh, what a concept. All right, so this is the board that I use. Going back to, where was I? The class. So again, everything I'm going to put out here and the website, look over here for updates. I put everything out there. How many of you have already started on the homework? Right? Don't wait till Monday. 
So if you go to the homework tab and you look at the homework assignment, poof, there it is. Ah, there it is. Which is nothing more than the syllabus, which I'm going to go over. All right? <clears throat> Do on Monday. If you're looking for information about the labs, it will show up here. Not yet available because I haven't written it yet. Quizzes and exams. I was thinking about having a quiz today, but I heard Dr. Sass already gave me the quiz. So I won't do that. Was that quiz surprising to some of you? It was quite a refresher. Quite a refresher or an eye-opener? <laughs> On some book. All right, we'll look at that. By the way, I do have some examples of old tests. I don't post finals, but this should give you a flavor of what I, the types of questions I ask. Keep in mind that these old tests are based on the old microcontroller. The 62, the M30 family of microcontrollers, uh, 62P, <clears throat> this is not what we use anymore. We now use the RX series of microcontrollers. So keep in mind that some of the questions aren't going to be exactly the same. But it'll give you an idea of the type of things that I ask. Again, I keep a, uh, an old uh, history of my announcements. Of course, there's no class on Monday, September 5th, because it is a holiday. That is a week and a half away, Memorial Day, Labor Day, sorry, it's Labor Day. For those of you not used to this, uh, there are a couple of holidays throughout the, this semester that we will celebrate. One is Labor Day. There's no class on Monday the 5th. There will be no classes on two days in October. It's a Monday and a Tuesday. That's fall break. And then around our Thanksgiving time, which is Thanksgiving Day is the last Thursday of November. On the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of that week, we have no classes either. So uh, we meet in classes all the other times. By the way, the, uh, um, there are some additional information here for notes. So I will put, for example, a copy of the uh, um, a copy of the book here, so that you can go and print it out. As I said, there is no book you have to buy for this class, but there is a board that you need to uh, purchase. Uh, if you would like, I could make you buy the book. No. So if you feel like it, you just I don't know, give me ten bucks or something like that. The, uh, uh, the whole idea is that uh, uh, when you buy the board in the future, you will actually get a copy of the book on a CD. So this book is actually going to be free for anybody who buys their board. And it is a textbook, complete with questions and uh, transparencies that a professor can use. So let's look at one of the more interesting things associated with our class, that being the syllabus. So if we were to open up the class syllabus, my office hours are Monday through Wednesday, 1 to 2. I will, or when my door is open. So if my door is just barely cracked open, that counts too. If you need something outside of those hours, I will try my very best to accommodate you. However, I'm finding more and more that I'm in a lot of meetings. And so um, it's really hard for me to, it's really hard to tie me down at any time. That's why. You could always walk by, and if my door is open, ask a question. People do that all the time. Of course, the class is here. I, shoot, I didn't change this. We have a TA. His name is Michael McLean. Many of you know him. He will uh, have office hours from 1.30 to 3.30 on Monday and Wednesday. Or snickering. You had him for 31.56. So Mike McLean, I will post his information on the website, and then, of course, uh, I'll update the syllabus for that. Woodward 200? He will be mostly in Woodward 203, which is our lab. Because when you do labs, you will have to demonstrate the lab. And so you usually need the PCs that we have in our own lab in 203. More on this later. Prerequisite for this is computer architecture, or 
for graduate students a background in computer architecture, computer organization. As I said, introduction to embedded systems using the RX62N is free, available for you to print. That means you'll have to use print quota or use your own little printer at home. If you would like, uh, how many of you want to see this? Uh, I mean, I can give it to Gray's Bookstore or someplace like that and they can make copies of it. Do you want to see that? Would anybody do that if I did it? Would anybody buy it from them if I took it there? I, I don't know how much it'll be. Usually they charge like 10 cents a page. And this thing's going to be 400 pages, so that's roughly $40. Or you could just use your quota, which is, what, 5 cents a page? All right? Nobody interested? Then I won't put it there because it's a lot of work anyhow. Um, check out. I prefer you to buy it. If this is going to be a financial hardship, uh, talk to me afterwards. I will have you occasionally read articles off the website, class website, including, for example, homework assignment number one. There is a, an assignment out there to do. Tests are open books, open notes. Catalog description, you can read that as well as I can, purpose of the class. Uh, Hands-on experience with microcontrollers. You probably have heard that this is a difficult class. Or is it a time-consuming class? Which is it? Go ahead, tell me, what, what have you heard? Time-consuming class, time-consuming. When you have stuff that's hands-on, it's going to be time-consuming. All right. There are ways to go quickly when you do your hands-on activities. If you listen to our design guidelines, you'll go a lot faster than if you just do what you want to do. So, if you are going to... Uh, Follow our guidelines, it will not be as time consuming. For example, I had a student that, or I had two students that actually spent about half the time as everybody else on labs. And how did they do it? They put a little bit of functionality into a program, ran it, got, got a, just a little bit of functionality, made sure it worked correctly, added a little bit more functionality. Compiled it, ran it again. That's what you do in embedded systems. You develop it a little bit at a time. You don't throw a big, huge file through the compiler and then say, let's see what it does. Because then you're going to spend all sorts of time trying to figure out where in this big, huge program it failed. Whereas if you put that much functionality in it at a time, do you know where it failed? Well, it's in that little piece right there you just put in. So you know exactly where to look. And so once you get that little piece working, then you put in another piece. And you know what? This, piece, this little piece already works, so you don't have to look there again. And all you have to do is look at the next little piece. So again, you need to put a little bit of functionality in at one time. You will work a whole lot faster. So we're going to look at everything from uh, develop programs, controlling the microcontroller system efficiently, modern microcontroller, so it is a 32-bit in assembly language. Uh, okay, maybe I won't do assembly. I'll tell you what, I'll take that out. I won't make you do assembly, just see. And you should be thankful. Uh, some course topics. A lot of, let's get used to microcontrollers, since many of you have not touched microprocessor or microcontrollers at all. And then towards the end, more in the operating system functionality. Continuing on, labs, extremely important aspect of this class. Uh, you are welcome to do it alone or in pairs. I recommend pairs. I recommend pairs because you usually do a lot better when you have two people beating your head against one problem at one time. And in fact, there's a concept in agile software development called pair programming, where you sit in front of one computer with one keyboard and two sets of hands. So two people are there and they cherry off typing, they talk, and believe it or not, you have finished in less than half the time as if you had done it alone, doing half of it over here and alone doing it half it with another person. You actually go a lot faster. So you might want to consider that strongly. You also might want to strongly uh, uh, identify who you're going to do this uh, class with. For example, it always happens 
that I have the weakest students pair up together. Okay? If you think you're a weak student, do you want to trust another weak student? So, if you're a weak student, I look for a good student. If you're a good student, I know you want to look for another good student because you don't want a weak student to slow you down. But uh, I would like to urge the, uh, the stronger students, if you know who you are, uh, to work with a weaker student so that uh, you can bring somebody up to your level. And by the way, um, probably you'll, you'll go a lot faster too. One thing I don't like is, uh, well, which I'll often see is sometimes we have divorces. Everybody familiar with what an ugly divorce looks like in lab partners? All right. He said, she said, I'm doing all the work, they're not doing any work, etc. So when you choose your lab partners, it's really good to choose somebody that has approximately the same schedule as you. So you don't have those class conflicts. Uh, somebody who is going to be around at the same time. Now, I do have lab PCs available in 203. Everybody familiar with room 203 in Woodward? If not now, you will later. I'm going to, after this class is over, get all of you access to that room so you can swipe your card and get in there. There are nine PCs in there that you could use. So obviously, I can only accommodate 18 people working on a lab at any certain time. I usually see people will go and, when they buy the board, they'll use their own PC, do the lab on their own. And that's perfectly fine. In fact, that allows you to take the board home, that allows you to uh, work on it. By the way, if you uh, borrow one of my boards, you're not to take it out of the, uh, the building. So that would be another reason to buy your own board. Because you're going to need to check the board out and then check it back in from Eddie Hill every day. So, labs by doing. I will uh, have extra um, components for you to play with to connect to your board. So you're going to have a lot of hands-on work. Homework. Um, I assign homeworks and, and assign a minimal amount of points to it just to force you to try and do the homework because you'll learn a lot by doing the homework. And we grade it. Uh, doing really, really well on the homework will not ensure that you get an A in the class. However, I found that people who actually do the homework assignments themselves meaning that you don't copy it from somebody else who do it themselves, they actually do a lot better in the class. However, I don't take any assignments late, period. I don't take labs late. I don't take homework assignments late. If you miss a quiz, you missed a quiz. Otherwise, it's too much to keep up with. That's why I offer an opportunity for you to drop a couple of homework assignments and drop a couple of quizzes. So if you're sick one day and you miss a quiz, Oh well, I'm offering more than more than the minimum number of quizzes. Same with homework assignments. This tells you what to do. Don't fold the papers over. Uh, oh no, you don't turn it. You don't do that. You turn it in by uh, PDF, so you don't even have to turn it in by paper. All right. I know that was good to do. Uh, let's see. Quizzes. 15 to 17. I take the highest 15. Exams. There's a midterm and a final. So you'll get 75 minutes for the midterm, uh, 150 minutes for the final, and um, some multiple choice, true false, some fill out some question, you know, fill out the, uh, this, that, the other thing, and run a program, stuff like that. Um, you can only miss an exam if you are, for example, uh, uh, had an amputation and lost a lot of blood. All right, not too many people snickering. You're thinking, oh my gosh, I have to amputate my arm to get out of a test? Well, yeah, actually you do. So um, uh, don't miss exams. Missing class assignments, again, I don't do late. All right, for all of you who are undergraduates, you can sleep for a minute or two. If you are a graduate student, you are to do a project. A project will be something um, that is pretty appreciable and decent that you can uh, actually perhaps use for the start of your master's thesis or your master's project. Uh, you need to talk to me before you do it. This could be done in groups of two, three, and four. And I'll actually have a lecture of this later on something you can look at. 
if you are, as often happened, there are some students interested in working with me on a project for a class, you know, for your master's thesis, I will assign you something to, uh, and see how you do on that project for, uh, for this class, and if it looks pretty good, then, then I'll accept you into my research uh, uh, group, and then we'll have you continue on to that research project. Those were the deadlines. Of course, lectures. I use transparencies and I write some stuff on paper and then I post what I write on paper. All right? So, can you actually go through this class without actually showing up? Sure. Will you graduate or will you pass? Oh, heck no. Um, imagine this quizzes are 15% of your grade, right? If I were to grade on a 90, 80, 70, 60 scale, if you don't attend class immediately, you're not going to be uh, earning 15% of, uh, of the grade, and so that means you're down to a middle B before you even take a test. And that assumes that you're going to get everything done. You're going to get an A on everything, perfect on everything. So, I have found out in my history of teaching, total, all classes, ever, only three cases. That would be 99.9% .9 of the time it happens, and 0.1% of the time, three of all the people I ever taught, it didn't happen. If you show up for every class, you do every homework assignment, you take every quiz, you do every, um, you take every, uh, or you complete every lab assignment, you're here for every test. I've only had three people ever not pass. So I've only had three people who didn't get a a, B, or C for graduate student. You don't want to see, but you know, A and B. All right. So it confuses me as to now that I've told you only 0.1 percent of the students ever have not passed this class by you know not showing up. So that would say if I show up, I could pass this class. Would that be great? By three weeks, I will see at least a quarter of you not show up for one class or not do an assignment. Don't know why, but there you go. If you show up for class, if you do all the work, it's really, 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 really high probability of you passing the class. And why is that? It's a law of points. I offer a thousand points in this class. Each quiz is ten points. Each homework assignment is twenty points. Each uh, lab varies. So, you got to imagine if you're here all the time, you're going to get most of the points because I offer all partial credit. The other thing is, if you're here all the time, you have to learn everything and you pick it up. So, a 10 makes it. Uh, I, I hate failing people, but it happens. Uh, academic dishonesty. The biggest problem I have in this class is uh, students will start to cheat on homework assignments and lab assignments. And it usually happens somewhere around the middle of the semester, and I usually call anywhere between three and six students into my office, I hand them a sheet of paper, and say, I know you copied between this assignment and this si assignment, this person and this person, because look, there's a copy of both and they're identical. Down to comments in the program, okay? Kind of hard to fudge that one. If you cheat, if you copy from somebody else's work, I will write you up for the Academic Integrity Board, which means the first time they'll slap your hands and I will typically give you a zero for that assignment. Second time you go before the Academic Integrity Board and you could get expelled from the university. Now also figure this, if you don't do the work you're not going to learn and you're not going to pass the class anyhow. So do the work. You'll learn. If you have questions, you can ask me, you can ask the TA. Where there's lots of resources available. Course calendar, that's where it is. Student instructor and student comment. I will do my very best not to have my phone ring in the class. It would be nice if you didn't either. Um, but I understand that sometimes it will ring. So if you quickly rush and turn it off, I won't beat you up or anything like that. Uh, but if you actually take a call, if you take a call, first of all, that's kind of rude. Um, second of all, <laughs> I'll get really angry and I'll reduce your final exam because that's all I can think. All right, you have laptops. I know you like to look at laptops. Uh, 
When I have notes, I often see people follow along with the notes. I'm very happy that nobody actually has one open. Oh. You look, are you checking your Facebook? No, I had Okay, okay, very good, very good. Um, if this class gets so boring that you're checking your Facebook, I really want you to tell me because that means I need to do something, all right? If you don't think this class is worthwhile, that you're checking your email and doing everything else, man, let me know because you're not getting anything out of this. And if one or two or three or four of you are doing that, then there's obviously a problem. So I need, you know, I need to fix it. So do me a favor. If things not going well, just let me know. Uh, communications, I try and answer emails within 24 hours. I do really good when you ask little, really little questions. If you give me a big paragraph, you know, telling me your tale of woe from when you were a child and how you're affected and you can't do homework in 12 point font because you know something happened when you were a small kid. Um, I'll usually put those off to later. So little questions that I can answer with really quick responses. Man, I tell you what, I can I respond to those really quickly. Um, please try and be responsible for that. Uh, but I am a stickler. If you can't write me an email in English, I do not speak text. I can understand it, but I don't actually converse in text. So, how are you, you know, using only five characters? Um, no. I want to see complete sentences, periods, correct capitalization, good English, because I'm trying to teach you not only how to do embedded systems, but how to work in the corporate world. And I assure you, your bosses don't, won't appreciate how are you when they get an email. Um, uh, productive professional con conduct. This is something that somebody gave me. In other words, don't start fighting in the classroom or being rude or anything like this. I really haven't had people have fist fights in the room. I don't want to start either. So uh, if you could make sure you know to keep your fist fights outside, that'd be great. Um, you can read about turn it in sexual harassment. I will not tolerate it. Religious accommodations. Is Ramadan coming up this semester? It is right now? Okay. Um, there may or may not be a reason you have to miss a test or a homework assignment. Again, I don't make accommodations for quizzes and homework assignments on religious preferences because everybody gets dropped stuff, right? So if something else comes up that you need certain accommodations, here's the policy. Make sure you follow it. The policy means you need to give me something within a couple of days from now. The last day of adding a class, you actually have to respond. Well, wow. one of the first classes I ever taught Ramadan was in the spring. Does it just move all over the place? Yeah, it is. Okay. It gets earlier and earlier and earlier. All righty. Any questions before I start up with real material? Anybody scared yet? <coughs> A little bit? All right, so my seniors, who wants to pass? Let's see a hand raised up high. Who wants, who wants to pass as a senior? All right, all right. Oh, you're not a senior? Or are you a grad student? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, what did I tell you, seniors, to pass this class? <laughs> Show up. All right? If I didn't think it was important, I wouldn't tell you, tell you to, you know, if I didn't think it was important to show up, I'd say, ah, I don't care if you show up. Yeah, whatever you do. I care. I, I don't want to give Fs. The last time I taught this class, I gave four Fs. I gave one A, three Bs, and four Fs. Guess what those four Fs were? People who didn't do the assignments. So, do the assignments. All right? No other questions? So, I'm going to go directly into chapter one. <coughs> Well, I think I pretty much have gone over what is an embedded system. So this is where my uh, the screen is going to be showing up there, and then you won't see me actually write this stuff down. So uh, for those of you examining out in the world, oh well. By the way, I'm going to say uh, um, I start each of my 
slides, ECG R41, and this is uh, lecture one. Page one. And this is associated with chapter one, which is just simply the general embedding. Now, one thing I should also add, too, is that uh, when I had this class for, or when I had um, ran this class earlier, I had transparencies collected for the entire semester, and they were all ready. Well, since I've gone to a new board, I have to rework all the transparencies, and I'm kind of late working on those. In fact, I just got the book done. The book is the first priority because it has to go through the publisher. Now I get to work on the transparencies. So it may very well happen that what I hand right here will eventually turn up into transparencies. And I may show up with transparencies eventually. So you need to make sure that you check the website a couple of hours before class to see if there's anything out there. Because you're welcome to print out the transparencies and bring them into class. And then follow along that way. Uh, I'm a firm believer in multimedia. So you notice, so far I've given you demonstrations. Or I've, I've handed stuff out. I will give demonstrations of the tools. I will uh, use this over here. I'll put stuff up on the computer. All along. So, we've already looked at what is an embedded system. So I might at any time in the future, you never know for an exam or a quiz, ask you to give me, uh, give me the example of 10 embedded systems. And so let's see, what did we identify already? Okay, mobile phone, projector, Which one? Monitor. It's a really big one. Bigger than a bread box. All right, even bigger than that. Really big. Sarah. So big you can put four of your friends in it. How many uh, how many microprocessors do you think are in a typical car? I hear 40, 70. Some of the uh, higher end um, Mercedes Benzes have upwards of 170 microcontrollers inside. For example, you know those side view mirrors? There's one in there, in some, in some cars. How about uh, your GPS system? There's a couple. If that's embedded in the car, even better, right? Your radio? Anti-lock brakes? Airbags? Power windows? Power windows? Power locks? Security system? Security system? Rear backup cameras. So you start thinking of all the different things that are embedded in a car. In fact, you think about this. I think uh, it's in the documentation that some automobiles have uh, uh, a lot of weight in wiring in the automobile. And that's why they invented some uh, communication mechanisms like, like a CAN bus. being able to communicate between the uh, microcontrollers and that CAN bus will allow you to uh, transmit data, transmit instructions and in fact there's an old story how uh, with a particular type of Cadillac I believe it is uh, the way that you can you could actually uh, break into the Cadillac, start it up, 
and drive off without having the key would be to break off the side view mirror, get access to this communications network by just plugging in a small device, which would then say, open the doors and start the car. And then you can just drive off. Electronically, yes. I saw somebody the other day hack into a Subaru with a smartphone and drive yeah. off with it. There you go. It was a demonstration. Yeah. They still did it. So, as you can imagine, with embedded systems, there's going to also be the uh, security aspect of it. So, if you, uh, if you like the aspect of security, embedded systems is going to need a whole bunch of you folks. Because the other discussion, everybody familiar with pacemakers? Embedded system. Yeah. What happens if you're communicating wirelessly with your pacemaker and somebody hacks into it? And says stop. Stop the heart beating. Not too good, is it? So let's talk about if you're going to uh, uh, the whole reason you want to do an embedded systems. Typically, why embedded? Reduce cost. You may not believe this, but actually by using microprocessors and automobiles, it makes them less expensive. And even though it's adding the weight to it, uh, I think cars are lasting longer because of the microcontrollers inside of them because they're monitoring very closely how the car operates, uh, making sure that uh, it's clear emissions and it isn't gunking up the engine with too much oil, too much or oil that's old. My car tells me when my oil life is, uh, is pretty bad. So, Ryan reminds me to change my oil because it's getting thick and that means my engine will last longer. So why embed it is typically to reduce cost, but the other thing is more functionality. So think about, how many of you had a, a cell phone 10 years ago? Not too many of you, you're kind of young, right? 2001, yeah. 2001, let's say about 1998 was when they started really coming out with a lot of digital cell phones. Everything else before that was analog. Didn't last long, very, very uh, um, inefficient on battery life. Didn't, You'd have to charge several times a day. Digital phones now, if you don't make too many calls, it lasts, what, three, four days, right? The phone battery. That's all because of embedded systems making sure that the device itself is operating only when it should be. You could also reduce the, uh, the cost associated with your device because electronics actually fail less frequently than mechanical devices. How many of you have had a hard drive that has failed? Yeah. Kind of a bummer, huh? Now think about this. Solid state drives. No moving parts, right? Just a whole bunch of uh, flash memory. That's, that's how you store it on your machine. The power consumption is so much better. It's a heck of a lot faster. It lasts a lot longer. That's another example of an embedded system. Even though the hard drive itself is an embedded system, it's another example of even, uh, even more dependability because you're putting more embedded functionality into it. So, let's look at, to make a system, By the way, I will forget and I will often go, go beyond. So if you can give me a warning of a couple minutes beforehand, you know, maybe somebody back there can just go. Yeah. If it's coming close to the time. To make an embedded system. What do you think is involved in making an embedded system? What kind of people make embedded systems? Okay, the global name is what? Engineers, all right. 
everybody really shy? They didn't want to answer anything? Okay. So you'll have computer, you'll have electrical, you'll have mechanical, you'll have systems, and depending on what the application is, you might have some application specific uh, engineers as well. Well, you know. <coughs> it's not always that you need a manufacturing engineer. If I'm going to make a computer product, like a cell phone, by the way, I work for a company called Ericsson, Sony Ericsson, and we made CDMA cell phones. And we had each one of these types of people, or engineers, working on the project. Some of them were test engineers, some of them were design engineers. Some of them developed the manufacturing and test facility and uh, used LabVIEW, for example, to do the testing. So there's a whole bunch of different disciplines that all get involved in developing an embedded product. When I say systems engineer, this is uh, not necessarily the manufacturing side of systems engineering and, and worrying about uh, the flow of product. But this is more associated with uh, pulling together all the different engineers and the thoughts of engineering together. So, if I'm going to develop an engineer or a, uh, a system, engineer first needs what in the product cycle? Requirement. Speak up. Requirement. Requirements, very good. Did you read ahead in the book? I used to love. <laughs> Requirements. By the way, uh, um, just for my, you're obviously uh, from India, right? Yeah. Uh, when you did your uh, undergraduate, were you allowed to ask questions? It, it depends on the problem. So some other and some then. Okay. In this class, obviously, I'm opening it up for, uh, for discussion. You know, if I ask something, learning it out, that sounds great. So those of you who are not used to being able to participate in class, you can. You get my permission to participate in class. Um, some of you also, for the U.S. students um, in India, I hear, in, again, some of the professors, when I would walk into the room, you would all stand up, right? So did you get into your indoctrination last week where they told you don't stand up? Oh, you just knew not to stand up, right? Okay. So, um, a lot more discipline in India than here in the U.S., so uh, I, maybe I should make you stand up, right? <laughs> so we're going to take requirements. Requirements tell us what we're going to make. But more importantly, it'll tell us when we're done. So if one of my requirements says this cell phone will be able to transmit a, uh, a minus 45 dBm signal uh, a distance of one mile, I know that I will need to keep on working at the design until I can design a cell phone or a product that will be able to transmit a signal at that power level, starting at that power level and be received a certain distance away. And I can't deliver the product until I meet that. Or if I try and deliver it, somebody had better test to make sure that that requirement was met. And if it's not, then the customer who helped write the requirement says, you didn't give me what I want. Go back and fix it. So the next aspect of uh, designing a product would be? Speak up. Resources. Well, getting the resources, we're assuming that they're available. Designing. All right, we're going to do design. Yeah, the next part of the design is the design. Okay, so there are two levels of this. You have to make the specifications. And this is where you actually add in some additional information, like uh, you are required to use this microprocessor, you are required to use this memory, you are required to operate at this voltage. Sometimes the voltage may be a requirement too. 
And then we have a high level design. And then we have a low level design. And then we have implementation. Now the important thing I want you to, well, let me, and then let me go on, and, and that is uh, uh, implementation, and then there's test at several levels, and then delivery or manufacturing. Because very often, the product that, the embedded systems that you design and deliver is going to be a one-of situation. So, for example, um, we had some students work on a quad-rotor robotic vehicle this summer. And they were designing it. They were designing it. Not the first one, and then they're going to manufacture a whole bunch of them. They're designing one. And then they're going to use it. So they would go through these steps. And actually, it didn't work out too well, because you didn't follow the steps, right? You had a couple of your... Uh, uh, a couple of your engineers not want to do the upper levels. And uh, poor Anthony had to, had to try and scale back. Okay, guys, let's figure out what we're going to do. And they didn't listen, and they went off and did something anyhow. So remember that uh, doing everything at one time and throwing it into uh, your embedded board and then debugging it? And that was kind of like the same thing that happened, right? Now, imagine this. When you're an engineer, you're going to work for a company. What is the primary goal of the company? Assuming you work for a company. Some of you will work for an academic, academic organization. What do you think is the primary goal of the company? Make money. Make money. Everything you do needs to be geared towards having them make money. You will likely not work for a nonprofit. In other words, a company that doesn't care if it doesn't make money because the other wonderful thing about a company, a company is called cash flow. You have to have money come in so that they can pay your salary. And it's usually good for you to get paid frequently, like every two weeks. It's not good for you to get paid all the way at the end of your project. That's usually bad. I don't think many of you want to go for a year until you get paid. So, everything you do has to make, be done to make money. Efficient use of your resources. In other words, if there's something in the requirements that say, do this and do this, and you say, oh, I'd rather do those two things and add these other three things on, is that a good, these two things, are they going to cost money? The two extra things. Do they cost money? Yeah. Yes. Is your customer going to pay for them? No. no. They didn't want it. They only wanted the first two things, not the second two things. So, as a designer, you have to make sure that you do exactly what is specified in the requirements and literally nothing more. And that's part of the economics of working with a design. Because you can, you can do your design very fast and for example, if you're uh, looking at doing something really fast, you can take an existing microcontroller and program it and design some sort of printed circuit board that it's going to uh, go into, and you're able to get out something really fast and good enough. Or you can go slow and develop your own integrated circuit along with the printed circuit board that will do the same functionality. And there's a trade-off economics-wise. Is it cheaper to do a uh, microcontroller? Is it cheaper to develop a product that uses a microcontroller? It's cheaper. The hardware exists already and it's a lot faster. Now, if you're going to manufacture 25 million of these, which do you think might be a little bit cheaper? Well, the custom integrated system one. 
Because the trade-off might be that this microcontroller with the PCB and everything else will cost $5. But if you develop your own integrated circuit with PCB, you've now lowered the price to $2. And the difference is that you could have this out in three months, and you could have this out in seven months. But since your quantity might be high, Well, let's see. 125 million in parts versus 50 million in parts. So these are the types of things that an engineer needs to look at because even an engineer could affect the price of an end product by choosing different products, less expensive memories, slower microcontrollers because the requirements don't require you to go really, really, really fast. So it's really great. You have a choice, for example, you go out and buy a laptop. And let's say your laptop will do nothing more than run Microsoft Office products and view the internet. Does it matter how fast it runs? Not really. Probably in a couple of years, it'll be slow because everything gets gunked up and slow and bigger, right? However, if your requirements are that you're going to be writing or running some CAD programs, yes, you're going to want to make sure that you get something a little bit faster. The slower PC costs less, the faster one costs more, match the requirements. So, I think I mentioned a lot of stuff so far. And... There are a couple more things I want to cover. One is, in particular, when you're looking at an embedded system, there are all sorts of attributes associated with an embedded system. One is time. Is it hard real time? Can you think of an example of any product where you want something, your embedded system to be, you want something with your embedded system to execute immediately, and it must happen immediately. In other words, it can't delay it a little bit. Think car. Airbag. Airbags. Airbags. You do not want that to be, oh, I'll get around to it whenever. You know, you hit the wall, poof, you know, there goes your airbag right after you hit the wall, right? You want the airbag to go off as you're hitting the wall, or the other car, or whatever the case may be. Can you think of an example where an embedded system can get around to it just, you know, whatever? Alarm clock, CD player. And usually when you get around to it, is it like 10 minutes later? It's usually like a second later after you push the button, instead of the exact microsecond as you push the button. So CD player. Uh, microwave oven. How about sorting sorting names on your cell phone? That can be done whenever. How about actually identifying that there's a call out there? Well, that's pretty hard real time because the cell phone base station will go out and say every 1.024 seconds, you have no call. You have no call. You have no call. Oh, there's a call, there's a call. And when it says, oh, there's a call, that's when you need your system to say, oh, wake up. Okay, let's do the negotiations, let's set up the call. All right, now I get the call, here it's ringing, etc. So, you like that, huh? Oh, call, 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 call. All right, so, and, and don't forget, this is all recorded on video, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, the, uh, uh, the camera's uh, uh, lens cover's closed. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't see it on the screen. So, um, that is uh, some of the discussion for today. Um, I have included in here, I've pretty much covered everything that's, that's in chapter number one. So, we will start with uh, chapter number two in our next class, which is on Monday. Uh, remember, homework assignment number one is due on Monday. See, uh, can you hit...